So I think we're about there. I think we've got uh, most people joining. We did have nearly 200 people registered for this first Mesothelioma Matters. For those people that don't know me, my name's Liz Darlison. I'm head of services at Mesothelioma UK. And um, this, um, we've launched this, uh, the, our monthly Meso Matters webinar um, with what we think is a really exciting lineup for you. There's just a couple of housekeeping things that I'd like to say. So I have got uh, Julie and Faye from the ops team at Meso UK as wingmen, and they're going to be controlling people's um, mute buttons and their cameras. But we'd really appreciate it if you would also do that. Um, we opted to use our Zoom platform as it stood and not go for an additional really expensive um, facility and in the hope that this works. Um, and if it doesn't, then we will probably have to think about um, shelving out some money um, for, a, for a, a platform that we have more control over. So please, if everybody could mute and switch your cameras off. The only two cameras that will be on during the presentations will be Stefan and Stevens, and then I will pop back in for the questions. So it's a big um, warm welcome to Stephen Evans, who's Professor of um, Molecular and Nano Nanoscale Physics at the University of Leeds, and also, also to Stefan Marciniak, who is a Professor of Respiratory Science at the um, University of Cambridge, and also an Honorary Respiratory Physician at Addenbrookes. And um, we thought this would be an ideal um, presentation to kick off our uh, series of webinars because I'm, I'm sure many of you will have seen the flurry of social media activity after their paper was published in small journal uh, several weeks ago. Um, so please, they're going to um, split the 40 minute presentation time between them. Feel free to post your questions at any time during that and um, Faye and Julie will pick them up and I will pose them for you. Um, or please just add your questions into the chat facility. But just a reminder that all cameras off and um, please use the chat facility only. And with that, I'm going to head, um, hand over to Stefan, who I think is going to kick off uh, the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. And I'm gonna try and share now, this is the technical bit. Um, am I sharing? You are. Yes. Steve? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, uh, um, if at any point somebody can't hear me, if you send a message and then S Steve will shout at me. So I said, I'm Stefan Marcini. I'm a respiratory consultant at Adam Brooks in, in Cambridge and Royal Papworth Hospital. Um, and my lab studies a variety of conditions, but we're particularly interested in mesothelioma. Um, and it was some years ago now that Steve and I met at a conference down at the Medical Research Council. And he was talking about this exciting new um, nanotechnology as a way of treating cancer. So I sort of grabbed him after afterwards and wouldn't let him go until he agreed to work on us. And a few years later, um, the project that we're going to talk about today came to fruition. So I said, I'm, I'm uh, Professor Mike. It, uh, it email me on any of those email addresses or, or contact me via Twitter. I'm always happy to chat. So I probably don't need to tell this audience that our enemy is this. This is a lump of asbestos as it comes out of the ground. And it shows a couple of important features. First of all, it's a lump of rock. It's a mineral. It's a naturally occurring mineral found all over the world, but particularly it being dug up in Australia and, and Canada. It's also, it's an unusual mineral because it's fibers, it's fibrous. Um, and you can see that when it's cracked in half, there's, there's almost like a, a fabric appearance to it. And that made it the wonder mineral of the 20th century. It, you could take these fibers and, and, and um, turn them into yarn. And if you can turn something into yarn, you can make fabric out of it. And it has, abs it has really exceptionally good thermal properties of stopping um, heat passing. So for some relatively trivial uses, you can make really effective oven gloves. For probably more practical reasons, you can lag um, heating pipes and boilers, and so many boilers um, are, co are covered in this stuff. It's also, being, um, being a mineral, it's got amazing tensile strength, so if you mix it with cement, you turn a very brittle material into an incredibly strong material. So that's why many of the buildings that we have today, many of our hospitals, many of our schools, some of our homes, are filled with concrete that has this material in it. 
Um, it's also been used for some completely trivial purposes. Whenever you have some new technology, it's used for silly things as well. And so there are asbestos table mats, and, and I really don't understand why they made uh, um, asbestos um, insoles. But probably the silliest use of all um, is in this real, it's not a madman mock-up, this is a real advert for Kent cigarettes in the 1960s, which completely inexplicably had blue asbestos in their tip, as if they weren't deadly enough. They, they made these suicide sticks um, with asbestos in them. But apparently, more scientists and educators used Kent cigarettes um, with their microfibre filter. So, so, but today, this is what we see if we, have, if we come across asbestos in one of our buildings. And as I said, many of our buildings have this material in it. It's either best, best left alone or removed by an expert. And this chap here is in a full hazmat suit. You can see that he's got a very complicated breathing apparatus which filters out the fibers that are in the air. Um, he's even had to type, type, tape down the ends of his, his um, overalls so that none of the fibers can get in because this is, this is nasty material um, and it can become airborne as soon as you start working with it. Um, again, you probably know a lot about this already, but because it's a mineral, it comes. there are many different forms of, of asbestos. There's blue asbestos and white asbestos and brown asbestos. And people argue about which is more dangerous, but it doesn't matter, they're all dangerous. The story that one of them isn't, isn't toxic and another is, is just nonsense. Asbestos is dangerous full stop. And the reason it's dangerous is if you look at it under a high powered microscope, it is made up of these microscopic fibers. These are far too small to be seen with the naked eye. And they're so small that they can just hang around in the air like dust. And if they're hanging around in the air like dust, you can breathe them in. Um, and if we breathe in asbestos into the lungs, it, it can cause various inflammatory responses. And if you breathe very, very large amounts, so people worked in asbestos mines, they could get scarring, this asbestosis. If you have this inflammation going on in the lung, it can make other toxins worse. So people who have cigarettes, have cigarette smoke and um, asbestos are much more likely to get ordinary lung cancer. But what we're interested to talk about today is the cancer that arises from, um, I'm just gonna try and make, turn off a laser pointer. Here we go. The, uh, uh, the lining of the inside of the chest wall. The, the chest, this is a bit of chest wall and it's lined by this tiny one layer, one cell layer thick of cells called the mesothelium. And there is a similar one, one cell thick layer on the, on the lungs. And that allows the, the, them to, the chest wall and the lungs to slide over each other without us noticing. But unfortunately, these cells, which are involved in our defense as well, can gobble up foreign bodies. And if you gobble up a small body, it can allow to remove, remove it. So this is a cell that's gobbled up a small fragment of asbestos. But if it tries to gobble up a very large fiber, it starts to struggle. And it will imagine, it, it's, you can imagine that this evolved as a response to think big infections like worms. It starts spewing out pro-inflammatory signals and it causes the local set, set tissues to grow. And if you take, so if you take up normal, just crunched up amosite, little asbestos, little tiny fragments, it doesn't do anything to the pleura. But if you, this is, this is rabbit, if you, if you expose it to these little needles, um, it causes it to grow. And if it grows enough, it can then eventually turn into um, a cancer. And the cancer that we know that comes from the mesothelium is called mesothelioma. Um, I, I, I will, I'll pass over to, to Steve in one slide, but it's just worth noting, we are sadly the mesothelioma capital of the world because we used so much asbestos in the years immediately after the Second World War in rebuilding, we've got the most asbestos burden in the country. The level is going to reduce in the UK, but very slowly, but it's going to continue to rise around the planet because countries such as Brazil, Russia, India and China are still using as much asbestos as we did. So mesothelioma is gonna be a problem for the rest of this century. So we need new treatments and we need new treatments that works. And this is where Steve comes in. Steve, do you want to change um, over to your screen? Uh, absolutely, so I will try and start to share my screen. Is, is, that should be sharing now. So Stefan, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. 
Okay, thank you. So um, thank you both for the, the reminder of how we met a long time ago at that MRC Fellows event. And um, uh, to everybody, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's not often a physicist gets to, to link up um, to, to work on really fundamental but, but interesting problems of how we can tackle diseases in new ways. And the, and the approach that we're taking is new types of nanomaterials, which sort of have a bad reputation in their own right historically, but actually may not be um, all bad and may indeed have some very positive um, uses. And so these materials are known as theranostics, and that means that they've got both a diagnostic element to them, so they can be used for imaging or detecting disease, but they also can have a therapeutic element so they can be used in the treatment of the disease and so some materials now and increasingly so will have both capabilities of, and these are known as theranostics. The work I'm going to talk about primarily in, in the lead side of it is in developing these new materials and in particular their materials based on gold but, but you can base them around different types of materials and so the work was done um, in case I because I won't be finishing indeed, uh, we'll be moving back to Stefan. Um, Sunji Ye, who was the postdoc on this project, and Lucien Roach was a PhD who did some of the work, and Louise Coletta is my colleague in clinical medicine in Leeds. And so um, we, we've all worked together for a long time with the development of these nanomaterials, but it was a real pleasure and a long-term interest to work on this with, uh, with Stefan. So gold nanomaterials, though, are not new, and they've been used for many, many years in terms of colouring uh, glasses. So, so in the centre of this image, we see uh, the Lycurgus cup, which is uh, homed in the, or housed in the British Museum. And this is interesting because as you look at the screen, um, depending on whether the light is behind your shoulder, the cup will look green, or if the light is behind the cup, then the cup looks red. And that difference in coloration that you see when you're looking at this is due to fine gold particles, gold nanoparticles that they embedded in the glass during the, the manufacture of the glass. So that was from around uh, the fourth century AD. So the Romans knew about um, putting gold nanoparticles into glass. And then in the middle ages that got transferred. So most medieval uh, churches, when you look at the stained glass in those windows, the colour that appears red is actually caused by putting gold nanoparticles into the glass. So gold as a nano, they didn't realise, and neither the Romans nor in the medieval period, they didn't realise they were using nanomaterials, but they knew that if they treated gold in a certain way, they could embed it in glass and it would have certain properties. And then much more recently, um, we're all, I'm sure, familiar with um, the lateral flow devices that are going to um, all be used to test us to either whether we've got COVID or whether we've got the antibodies for COVID. And the one here was an antibody test. And it's, it's a very simple idea that um, you put a, a, a blot your blood on where it says S for sample you put a, a buffer, a, beast, a dilutant material, uh, where it says B for buffer. And as the buffer moves past the blood, it takes out any antibodies present, but it then moves through a small pad where you've got gold nanoparticles. And it takes those gold nanoparticles and it will leave a line if you've got the antibody IgM or, or IgG. So those would mean you've had the COVID virus in the recent past. And those red lines are caused by the gold nanoparticles. So these gold nanoparticles have been in, known to us for, for many, many years, and they're used in a wide range of things. And what I want to do, and this is going to be my only, ah, I can't advance the slide. So um, what, what um, this is the only physics slide, so apologies in advance uh, for those of you who would rather not know about the physics, but, but I'm going to keep it simple. And there's two very um, important things that we need to know. One 
is that we can represent light as a wave. So this is just our mathematical description of how we explain light in, in physics. Uh, we, we say it's got a certain wavelength, that's the difference between of the distance between two peaks or two troughs, and that determines the color of the light. So red light has a longer wavelength, blue light has a shorter wavelength, so the troughs are closer together. And that is important, and we'll come on to that. And then we've got our nanoparticle in the middle. And what I want us to imagine is if we could be shrunk down and, and stand on that nanoparticle. Oops. Uh, I, let me see if I can change this. So if we can stand in the center of this particle, and then we want to observe what the electrons do. So we're all aware that the electrons are the carrier of charge. They're these tiny, tiny particles that give rise to our electric current, but they actually also give rise to that coloration of gold and why gold is red when it's very small or not when it, it, it's on a, a larger scale. And as one of these waves moves across the particle, what we would see is as the peak moved across so if this peak part moved across this particle now, the observer would see all of the electrons pushed to the bottom and a lack of electrons at the top. And then as the trough of the wave moved across the particle, we would, uh, sorry, the advance isn't working on this. We would see it go the opposite way. So this means that the, the wave of light moves the electrons on the particle. They move it first up, then down. And this actually gives rise um, to, to light of different wavelengths that might be scattered in different directions. But more importantly for us in this application, it generates heat. So the electrons moving up and down on the particle is effectively cause friction. And that friction generates a lot of heat locally but each particle generates so little heat, you'd hardly know it. But on the, on the scale of a cell, uh, that can be quite intense. And so, so what we then want to do is, is we, we bear in mind that then particles can absorb light of given wavelengths. And what we've learned how to do over the years is to make gold of all different shapes and sizes. So we can make gold in rod shapes, we can make gold as hollow spheres, we can make gold as cages. And if we put those particles inside a solution, we can see depending on, in this case, the length of the rod to the width of the rod, the solution can look blue or it can look red and we can make many colors in between. And in Leeds, we've been spending a lot of time making different shaped rods. And so this is just some of the um, colors that, that, that we can see along, along the top. So a particle can, in a solution can look blue. That means it's absorbing the red light from, and this is important. So we graphically represent that by this curve down here, which shows the light being absorbed by a particle as a function of the wavelength, which was how close or far apart the troughs are. So this is a particle absorbing in the red, and that's, would look blue in solution and vice versa. On the other side, we have particles absorbing uh, that, that allow the red light through and therefore they absorb in the blue. Um, and that means that they're these particles. So we can tune where the particles are. And, and just before I go on, let's just get a length scale here. So um, we're talking about particles that are of, on the nanoscale. So that means they're on this tens to hundreds of nanometers. And to put that into context, a human hair is around 100 microns, which is 100,000 nanometers, right? So if you could take, or a piece of paper is roughly about the same width of about 75 to 100 microns. So if you could take a human hair and divide it 100,000 times, you would be at the nanometer scale and the particles that we're making typically will fall into this range. So these are some of our particles that we've made. And you can see this is a scale bar of an electron microscope that shows that these particles are of the order of 100 micro, uh, nanometers in length, which is typically the size of a virus or, or a bacterium. 
So, so this is important. So we know that we can make particles that um, can absorb light at any wavelength that we, we like. And there's an expert, I did this last night, so I, pro I, I apologize for, for the, the low budget nature of this, except I can't seem to get it to run now. Um, oops, let me go back. Uh, let me just escape from this for one second. I apologize, um, but the movie won't run. Steve, will it help you find the cameraman? Yeah, I'll, I'll, ah, here we go. So this is a very simple experiment. You take a, a, a torch that's bright white and you just shine it through your hand but what you can see is red and you can see the red is actually coming through the tissue, right? So all of the other wavelengths of light are being absorbed into the tissue. And if I was to do it more carefully, you'd actually see some structures within the hand. So some of the blood vessels, et cetera. So what this is showing us is that, and this is the important aspect of this, that the tissue in our body is transparent to certain wavelengths of light, and in particular, those wavelengths of light that are in the red. And this is known as the biological window. This is our more um, typical representation of this in, in, in physics. We would show that light absorbs, so where it's high um, in the blue region and also in the inf far infrared region. But there's a region where if we can get the light to shine on this wavelength, then it would travel through the tissue. And it's here that we want to make our nanoparticles so that they will absorb the light. So then we can use these particles to generate that heat that I've already mentioned. So if we can do that, then we can use the particles to actually um, irreversibly damage the tissue. So obviously we want to do that only at the cancerous site. So uh, these particles get to very high temperatures, but locally they would only heat the tissue to about plus or minus 10, oh, sorry, plus 10 degrees. So from 37 degrees body temperature to 48 degrees is all you need to, to locally kill um, that cancerous tissue. So that's what we're aiming to do. You make particles that absorb in the biological window where your skin is transparent. And with that, um, I'm having real problems with the advancing on this, I'm not sure why. So with that, we would make, we, we designed particles that we could make, um, and these were gold nanotubes. And the advantage of, of this was to try and give us a way of targeting, putting molecules on the outside of these uh, nanotubes so we could target them to where the cancer site is. Um, to actually be able to put drugs on the inside of these and to use actually a, a thermal release mechanism to release drugs just at the site where these nanotubes have gone. And, and we're not going to talk about that really now because that ideally is the next stage of where we'd like this work to go. Um, but how do we make a, a nanotube? How do you, you know, it's fine to have the idea, but you've then got to make one and these are not trivial to do. And the way we do it is we make a go a silver nano wire, so a solid wire of silver. Um, I'm just trying to put the pointer on. So, so this is a, a, a silver wire. We start with a silver nanoparticle. We turn that into a wire, and then we start to deposit gold onto the outside. So you, and as the gold deposits, the silver becomes soluble in the water that the gold that the gold is in. And so the gold grows thicker until all the silver is gone, until what you can see on the right hand side is just a hollow tube. And in the study that we've just performed now with Stefan, what we showed was that the wider you make the silver to begin with, the wider you make, or the thicker you make the walls of this device. And that's important because the way, I'll, I'll just skip through these because I'm conscious of time and I can always come back. So these are silver nanowires that we've made and we've made them from 50 nanometers-ish diameter 
up to a few hundred nanometer diameter. And that's shown schematically as it were on the right. We have some polymer that's around the outside and that helps control the growth of these, the thickness of these that you get. And we then go on and, and deposit the gold onto the outside. And so what you can end up with are these tubes. So hopefully you can see this is the end of a tube or this is the end of a tube. Uh, you can see when, when the tubes are in the right angle that these really are hollow and they're sort of straw-like. And on the right-hand side here, these are some that have, we've been able to get the cross sections of. So it's only 12 nanometers wide, 25 nanometers wide, or seven nanometers wide. And the reason that's important is actually the width of that tube determines where they absorb the light. So if we want to tune it to being in the near infrared, um, which is this uh, slide at the bottom, we want our tubes to be absorbing light somewhere around here, ideally in the, where the biology, biological window is. And so by tuning the width of, of the thickness of the tube, we can make these absorb light in the right place. And then the only other thing I'd like to say is we need to then carefully put a surface coating on to make sure that these don't have any adverse effects when they're in the body, any toxicity effects of their own. And that's what we've done here. We've just shown uh, very quickly that if we put these tubes into cells, the cells actually, the cell viability is how well the cells cope with these tubes. They all stay alive. They're all very happy actually, even with our highest loading. If we now shine a laser light on those cells that have taken up those nano tubes, what we find is that if, the if they had 50 micrograms of these nanotubes um, in the solution before they took the gold up, then we would, we would kill almost all of the cells by this thermal treatment. So this shows, this is actually work that we did because we don't, haven't done mesothelioma in Stefan, which is why that's such a nice uh, collaboration. This work was on a colorectal cancer cell line, but it just showed, helped us show the principle um, that, that this could work. And I think with that, um, I, will, I will leave this, but, but this is just to show we can do it in vivo. So this is an image of a cross section of a mouse with a tumor on the flank marked in T. And it's before and after we've added the nanotubes. And this is just showing that the nanotubes are accumulating in the tumor region and therefore could be used then for this uh, photothermal therapy. So, so uh, we, this is at the preclinical level. We're now at the point where we think uh, this is a viable uh, technology for, for the treatment of cancer. So with that, I will uh, pass back to Stefan. So I will stop sharing. I will try to share. Apologies about the lack of smooth transitions in my slides. For some reason, it, it, my, my next button wasn't working properly. OK, am I sharing my right screen now? You are, yeah. Brilliant. OK, so this is where the mesothelioma um, comes back in. I, I've worked for many years with um, an organization called Mesobank. Uh, and some of you may know about it. It's the National Mesothelioma Tissue Bank where we store mesothelioma tissue that patients have, have donated to us. We, um, and we've generated various extra reagents that people can use called tissue microarrays, which you can possibly talk about on another occasion. But most importantly, we have lots and lots of cell lines, cells that grow in, in, the, in, the, in the, the lab, which are from patients with mesothelioma and are, and are quite, and they've not been out of the patient for very long. So they still, um, behave as if they were real mesothelioma cancers. So, so what can we use these for? Um, so this is a mesothelioma cell. This is actually a real mesothelioma cell in, the, in, the, in plastic. And those pink things are some gold nanotubes made in Steve's lab. And these important people down the right, right the top person is Sanji, who was the postdoc in, in um, Steve's lab, and the next two, Joe Chambers and Arsalan Azad, are postdocs in my lab. And this team together were really the, 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 the driving force behind this project. And what I think you can already see is that if you just put those gold nanotubes next to a mesothelioma cell, 
the mesothelioma cell seems to gobble them up. It's called endocytosis. So, but when we look at a mesothelioma cell here in purple and these little yellow, these little green things are the nanotubes, the nanotubes um, they look as they, they might be either on or inside the, um, the mesothelioma cell. But with sophisticated microscopes, we can look inside cells in three dimensions. And I'm sorry if this makes you feel sick because it's whizzing around, but now as that is going inside the cell and that little green, those little green things are some of Steve's gold nanotubes which have got inside the cell. So we know that these devices can be put inside the mesothelioma. In fact, the little mesothelioma cells seem to avidly gobble them up. Um, so we can do more sophisticated analysis of that. Here we see three different mesothelioma cells um, in time-lapse microscopy. And these little black chippings everywhere are the gold nanotubes. That's how they're, they're much smaller than a cell. But what you'll see is that when a gold nanotube touches a cell, nothing happens for a bit. And then all of a sudden he moves in a, in a, in a very purposeful direction into the center of the cell. And this happens, and we can look at this automate, in an automated fashion thousands and thousands of times. And it proves that these, these gold nanoparticles are taken up actively by a mesothelioma cell and deposited in their center. In fact, we can do various analysis. We can see that this is the speed of that gold nanoparticle, the one that we tracked down there. And most of the time he's sitting there doing nothing, minding his own, own business. But as soon as the mesothelioma cell gobbles him up, it's called endocytosis, it, it accelerates in one direction. And then once it gets to its destination, it stops moving again. So this is an active process by the mesothelioma cell to take up a gold nanorod. But where is it going? It matters actually, if we're trying to kill this cell, we need to know where these gold nanotubes, we know these gold nanotubes are getting inside the cell, but we wanna know where they're going inside the cell. And actually inside a cell is, is fiendishly complicated. Cell biologists like me make a living from the, this complexity. And this is a sort of a simplified version of some of the organelles. We call them organelles, little structures inside the cell. The biggest one that most people heard of is the nucleus. And in all these images, it's blue. It's the, um, it's the bit where we keep all of the DNA. But there are lots of other little compartments. Think of them as rooms that uh, the cell uses for different purposes. For example, if you gobble up a particle from the outside, you put it into these little vesicles. Because then those vesicles go to a series of sorting stations inside the cell, early endosomes, late endosomes, and they might be spat back out of the cell, or they may be sent to a degradation, a destruction compartment like the trash compactor of the cell called the lysosome. And there are many, many, many more organelles. And poor old Azed in my lab took cells that he treated with Sunji's gold nanoparticles and systematically went looking for where they were in the cell. And the way we do this is we take a marker, take a protein like LAMP1, which is found on a particular organelle in the cell, and we attach a colored um, marker to it. So all of the lysosomes, this is LAMP1, which is a lysosome marker. All the lysosomes in this cell stain purple. Um, for example, here we got SNX1, which is um, a, a recycling endosome marker and all of those endosomes are, are marked purple. Uh, or here, Bodipi is a, is a lipid droplet marker. So you can see we can identify and we can look for if the gold nanoparticles and the organelle marker is in the same place. And that will be shown as the gold nanoparticles are green, but co-localization comes out in this assay as white. So we're looking wh which, which are the ones that are showing up white. And the most white came with LAMP1 and LAMP3, which are markers of these lysosomes. So the cell is taking up these particles and shipping them off for destruction in the lysosome. But of course, the lysosome can't possibly destroy a piece of metal. Um, so it runs into tr trouble. There are limitations. This is a, a, a physics-y bit, but this is a biologist's simple version of physics. There are limitations with wavelengths of light of what we can see. This is a beautiful picture of a cell with the green nanoparticles in it, and we can blow them up, but we can't see the detail. But we have a microscope called an electron microscope, and in fact, we can look at, at the light and the electron microscope of the same cell, and we can see here the gold nanoparticle in beautiful, beautiful detail. You can probably even, I can convince you probably it's hollow, and it's even bent in the middle, whereas in the light microscope, it's just a blob. 
So using, a, using an electron microscope, we can look carefully through our mesothelioma cells to see where the gold nanoparticles go. So this is a mesothelioma cell. This part of the project was done in collaboration with Ian Pryor, who's a scientist up at Liverpool. So it gives you an idea about how complex these projects are. We've got the nanotechnology happening in Leeds, we've got the biology happening like down at Cambridge, we've got the, some of the imaging happening in Liverpool, and all these teams are working together. Very collaborative and fun environment. Here we see, if we look at this part of the cell, let me just turn it into a laser pointer. If we look at this part of the cell in more detail, we can see one of um, Steve's gold nanoparticles inside a vesicle. It's actually inside a lysosome. And I think, you'll believe, I, think I can convince you that that lysosome is being deformed by this metal rod. And we can actually take sequential pictures as we're going down through the cell. And we can see that actually there are portions places where the gold nanotube appears to erupt out of the lysosome. So what we believe is that these gold nanoparticles are taken up by the cell, actively moved to the right lysosomes, but then because the lysosome isn't able to destroy them and they are rigid metal structures, they start disrupting and popping out. And in fact, if we look, this is the same cell at a slightly different level, we can see another gold nanoparticle, a gold nanotube, and here you can definitely see how beautifully hollow it is. And it's a completely escaped out of this organelle and it's just floating around freely in the, the substance of the cell we call the cytoplasm. So we've already, so we've learned that uh, mesothelioma cells are very happy to gobble these things up to endocytose them, then actively shift them towards the part of the cell where they have these structures, the lysosomes but then they escape the lysosomes to sit in the cytosol. Now that means they are these gold nanoparticles, which Steve has told you we can warm up with red colored lasers, will be sitting right next to very important uh, machinery inside the cell. So here we're sitting right next to the nucleus, absolute critical control center for the cell. It's also sitting next to a mitochondrion, which is a part of the cell that is like the People think of it as the boiler room. It's where you, you, you make this, the cell makes energy that it can use. So these gold nanoparticles are now sitting next to important components of the cell. So this is an, an experiment which is beautiful because it was half done by Sanji and half done by Azad. And so here we're looking at the temperature. This is Sanji has done this. We're looking at the temperature of these gold nanoparticles in solution starting at, it wasn't actually at zero, it's where they start at. And when she shines the laser light on them, she can heat them up easily to eight degrees. And when she turns the light, the laser light off, they cool down. And when she does it again, she can warm them up. So you can, this is a, this is a, um, these gold nanoparticles, they stay there, they warm up, you turn the laser off, they, 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 they cool down. So what happens with our mesothelioma cells now? If we just have the gold nanoparticles here, sorry, no, this is just with the laser. If we use this red laser, red laser light does nothing to these tissues. As Steve said, this was chosen specifically because it can pass through tissues without causing any harm. So 100% of our cells start off alive. After we've irradiated them with this red light, 100% of them are still alive. If we treat them with a small amount of Steve's gold nanoparticles, again, there are 100% of them are still alive. But if we then take these cells that have gobbled up the gold nanoparticles and we shine the red light on them, they start dying. So we now have a beautiful sort of careful way of killing the mesothelioma cells. The laser by itself isn't dangerous, the particles by themselves aren't dangerous, but together they cause, um, they cause mesoth mesothelioma cell killing. That's where we are now. Where we would like to be is to put these into patients or, or find some even better ways of targeting them only to the mesothelioma cells. And then we can shine tissue penetrating red light onto the patients in the parts of the chest that we want to treat, nowhere else. And then we can warm up those, mesothel those, um, those mesothelioma cells 
to that magic eight or 10 degrees, as, as Steve said, causing mesothelioma kill, kill, killing in an exquisitely um, careful and targeted manner. So I think I've talked enough, is this, but, but this is the most important part of the talk, it's the thanks. This work would not be possible were it not for people like you fundraising. It turns out a lot of this work was funded by one wealthy benefactor called Victor Dardenne, um, who's funded um, both Sanji's salary and Azad's salary. Um, we've also had support from the British Lung Foundation and the Mick Knighton Mesothelioma Research Fund. Um, the June Hancock Mesothelioma Fund are also fund, um, um, paying for some research projects in our group. And the, um, the EPSRC, which is the country's national engineering um, um, re government funded research um, body is funding further na nanotechnology advances um, in a number of universities, including Cambridge, to try and find novel engineering solutions to what is a medical problem. So Robert Rintoul and Doris Razzle and I run Mesobank. Steve Evans is really the, bra the brains behind the nanotechnology in, up in Leeds. And George Mali Maliaris is running the engineering um, efforts that we're making down in Cambridge as well. And thank you very much for listening. And hope hopefully I've left enough time so that we can answer any of your questions. So. Wow. Thank you both so much. And um, on behalf of the whole Meso community, particularly patients and family members, a big thank you to all of your teams as well. And you referred to a lot of them there during the presentation um, for their commitment to getting this far. Um, because I think the, the biggest thing of all is this is a this is a huge helping of hope in hearing this kind of presentation to people living with mesothelioma. Um, and those people also who know that they are potentially at risk because of, uh, you know, previous exposure and so on. So we've had a number of questions come in that I'm going to try and go through. Um, but the first thing I wanted to say, we did have a few technical difficulties at the start. So apologies to people who tried to access and couldn't get on. Um, but we hope we've put that right now. And just a reminder for everybody to keep their cameras off and to keep muted. Um, and I also just wanted to say, I was meant to say this at the beginning, but today saw the launch of actionmeso.org. And you referred to how important collaborations are in research. And actionmeso.org is a collaborative approach to raising awareness about mesothelioma. And it launched today at 11 o'clock. And if you go on any of the meso organizations, uh, social media, you'll see that they're all carrying the same logo to, um, to, to raise awareness and hopefully raise some funds too, because quite rightly, as you've said, that's vital. Um, so I'm just going to crack on with some of the questions. Um, and I think one of the first ones is from Nina Tully, um, who we had some email questions come into the charity um, in, in the week leading up to um, this evening's presentation. And Nina asked, how is the treatment delivered? So how is it actually delivered into um, or how will it actually be delivered into patients? Do you know at this stage? Well, I, I, I'll have a go and then Steve, and, Steve can say, um, I'm we're quite open to various various approaches. Um, some of these things, uh, and Steve could probably talk a little bit about how we can be target them to particular cancer cells. Um, so you could imagine it being given in the blood, but one of the, the one of the few good things, if there is a good thing about mesothelioma, is it tends to be very local, localized. So you could either have local injection, but you could also, we know a lot of my patients, because I, you know, I, I do mesothelioma, I, I look after patients with pleural disease as well, will have indwell, indwelling drains. And there is no reason we can't access those drains to put medicine in directly into the chest. In fact, some of the engineering research we're doing down at Cambridge is trying to develop gels which will stick to the cancer carrying either ordinary chemotherapy or nanotechnology like the stuff we're talking about today. And they, those could actually be put onto the cancer and they would stay there for some time to constantly delivering the treatment. Steve, Steve do you have anything to add? Uh, <clears throat> well, I, I suppose there's a couple of things. So one is if you were delivering through the blood, as it were, then we can actually put targeting agents on the outside of the tube. So uh, we, the nature of tubes mean that they're quite long compared to normal nanoparticles, which means they can have many interactions with surfaces and cells. 
and that can give enhanced uptake of these particles to the to the right area if you've got the right targeting on the outside so molecular targeting is one way of aiding that delivery to the right place and certainly we've done that in the case of colorectal cancers um, the other is the size of the particle is also actually because we know we can tune that you can try and change the aspect ratio and change the tuning of the size to go to the right location so you you get um, more specific uptake into tumors depending on the um, or into tumor sites depending on the vasculature at the tumor site or and, and this is I'm a physicist talking outside of this knowledge zone here originally one of one of the thoughts i had was um when you're looking at asbestosis obviously it, it is a fiber and it has a certain aspect ratio and, and the knowledge of that can allow us to actually tune if you like a trojan horse where you've got your gold nanotube filled with a drug, a chemotherapeutic, that you could thermally release the drug, and a small three or four degree increase in temperature will significantly enhance that drug uptake into the, uh, into the cells near that tube. So actually, there are, that, there are probably many, many different ways we could enhance the uptake, but, but actually, if you want fibres to stick in the same places where asbestos fibres stick, um, then we can tune the aspect ratio to more match that, but then have this added bonus that we can tr make sure that they don't enhance inflammation, but, but, but they can release therapeutics at that site and aid that uptake. So, it's all, it, I mean, <laughs> in the world of mesothelioma, for the mesothelioma community, I just think we've gone so many years without, um, you know, an awful lot going on. And then, you know, in the last few years, we've seen clinical trials in targeted therapy, clinical trials in immunotherapy. And now this is a whole new treatment. I mean, never mind the surgical clinical trials and the radiotherapy clinical trials, but this is another treatment modality, potentially. And, um, you know, that is pretty phenomenal. You know, it's, it's just, we, we seem to be, although it can't come fast enough, we know that for many people. Um, it just seems that we're coming on leaps and bounds and it's all very, very hopeful. Um, another question that's come in is um, how far away do you think we are from actually having early phase clinical trials? Oh, gosh. So so getting into to early phase clinical trials, we've got us. I mean, I, Sonia tried to, to, to force me to come up with a, um, a, a first in man date. And, and when doctors don't know, we say five years. So if I said five years, and that, that, that's me being honest. But what I can say is, with, certainly with the engineers down in Cambridge, they're already at the point where they're wanting access to, 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 to Pleura, so they can see how well, for example, the gels stick to them. So we're working with the vet school um, in order to try this on tissue already. So whilst um, Steve and clever people like him are making their particles far more sophisticated and more targeted and working better. At the same time, we're doing the, the sort of the drudge work, working out how do these materials behave when you're putting them down a chest drain? How well do they stick to the pleura when you put them on them? So I do think five years is me being quite cautious. Um, right. right, well, okay. Well, all I can say to you is that we've got a really tight knit meso community, as I'm sure you're aware in the UK, um, and recruitment to clinical trials in the UK in mesothelioma is pretty phenomenal. You know, we, we've seen with the MIST study, we can open up arms of the MIST study for, you know, uh, 25, 26 patients, and we can close it in weeks. Yeah. So, um, you know, the community is there ready and waiting for you. And um, another question that's come in is, is this um, technology, and it's a plea really, I would say, that often when you're developing clinical trials, um, please ensure that you have patients and the voice of patients in the trial development. Um, we try really hard to be as inclusive as we can so that peritoneal patients are included. And so it's a plea. Have you thought about peritoneal patients and can we make a plea for them to be included? So this is a, a great one. I, I, I already gave a plug to the June Hancock Mesothelioma Research Fund and they are funding a, a specific peritoneal mesothelioma mesothel uh, project in my lab because I said, 
scientists, we think, ah, oh, mesothelioma is mesothelioma, and we know that families don't necessarily think of it the same way. So the June Hancock Mesothelioma Research Fund is, is allowing us do some, to do some research just so it can reassure us that there, the, the treatments that we're making for pleural mesothelioma in the chest will, will behave similarly in, um, in the abdomen for peritoneum. So yeah, we're not forgetting that. And right. I've met with the, the family that raised, it was their daughter, sadly, who died of peritoneum mesothelioma at the age of 30. And I met with them and it was one of, uh, one of the action mesothelioma days last year. And it was one of the most moving experiences of my life. So yeah, we're not forgetting peritoneal mesothelioma. Good, thank you for that. And, and I know that Meso UK, we are also funding some genomic work in co-funding uh, with another funder into peritoneal mesothelioma. Uh, working with the basic so there is stuff going on it's just when the clinical trials open it's just great if we can be have a really pragmatic mm -hmm. approach and be you know you mm -hmm. know keep the entry criteria as broad as possible um, a question that's come in just ahead of that is would money make a difference so if you had a flood of money would it make a difference to um to the speed steve <laughs> well i i mean it it depends where you view the sticking point. So the speed to a clinical trial, um, what we would need to do is to, firstly, going on from the work that Stefan's just described that's still going on about where, where will these particles end up and when you're interacting. Um, we would need, firstly, a proper preclinical study, I think. So, so that, that's not been done yet um, with, a, with good models systems for that and I'm not uh, I, I'm a physicist so I don't know um, well what you need to do that in two stages is my understanding or two different type animal types um, and so obviously that work needs to be ongoing and, 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 and started because if that will pave the way for the regulatory aspects and packages to be done before this could ever be thought for that first trial Having said that, there is good precedent. So gold nanoparticles have been used for the treatment of liver disease. So in that sense, it's something that already, not, not as nanotubes, but gold is fairly inert. And we know how it breaks down in the body and where it goes and how it's excreted and so forth. So, so there is not a, a lot blocking it other than having those regulatory um, sort of data packages that we would need to do the translation. So that requires people and which in turn and, and data and which in turn requires money. But I don't always think money is the answer, but, but of course it, it, it is what's it would help. necessary to generate that information that we need. Yeah. I mean, it, one thing's not uh, is so quite surprising to most people. I think the, some of the, the most expensive thing I think in science is the salaries, and it's not that they're paid a lot of money. It's that that, that actually paying. So the reason I showed Sunji and and Joe and Azad is that they're the people who who did the work. You know, Steve and I can have ideas and we can guide them, but somebody day in day out has to come in six or seven days a week to do the experiments, and it's their salaries that we've we we've to pay for, and that's what. Your, your funding provides. I would also say that relatively small sums, I mean, there's nothing small sum, but if you have a grant of sort of 20, 30,000, we think of that as a small sum because we can spend that in no time at all. But it allows us to get the data that then we can leverage, we can then hoik in extra, extra funds. So because of these relatively small projects, that's how we were able to get the EPSRC grant, which is about, which is more than 10 million. Okay, it's spread between many research groups, but so the, I would not underestimate the power of charities like yours with seed funding, which start projects that show they can work. It then brings in extra funding from the government and from other organizations. Victor Dardelay, for example, he's Canadian, and he just could see how much mesothelioma research is being done in this country. And he decided to give five million to the UK for it. Yeah, and it's lovely to see, you know, the benefits of the, that investment. Um, and thank you for saying that, um, you know, the smaller grants that charities like us can offer, those seed grants, they are proof of concept grants, really, I guess, that can be the seed that uh, from what Mighty Oaks grow. So, you know. Governments won't give you 10 million based on a good idea. They'll give you 10 million based on a good idea and lots of preliminary data. Yeah. And that's what, that's what your charities pay for. We're already at five. There is one quick question. And uh, if you could answer this just quick, because I don't want to keep you any longer, but it is um, 
the last question, how do you ensure that the nanotubes target tumour rather than healthy mesothelial cells? The, the answer is um, that's work in progress. The second answer is I don't think it really matters because I, I, I look after lots of patients with, um, with um, pneumothorax as well, another pleural disease. And when I send my young patients to them with, I just say, remove all the mesothelia, we don't need it actually. So actually, if we could ablate, so one of the things is what, what would we do with this treatment? It'd be great if we could get rid of every mesothelioma cell. But one thing is if we could destroy a lot of the mesothelioma, but also the normal mesothelium, we would make the lung stick to the chest wall. That's brilliant, because if the lung is stuck to the chest wall, the chest can't fill up with fluid. And then the patient doesn't have to spend their life coming in and out of hospital to have the fluids drained or to have a drain put in. So I think it's a very good question as to how we, how, we die, how we target a particular type of tissue. And we'll do that by putting antibodies and things on the cell surface. Do we want to protect normal mesothelium? No, I would, I would get rid of the lot. Lovely. OK, well, with that, I'm going to close the session. Uh, Stephen and Stefan, I can't thank you enough. And please pass on our gratitude to all of your team and um, tell them how positively it's been received. There have been so many comments in the chat saying thank you so much. Um, and, that you know, there is hope, hope on the horizon. So thank you both very much. And just in closing, I just wanted to remind people about actionmeso.org that launched today. Some people made, we didn't charge anything for people attending, of course, um, but some people made donations on the back of today's um, presentations. And I just wanted to thank those people. It has been recorded and it will be going out live, linked via our social media onto our YouTube channel. Um, and thank you for that, for people that didn't manage to see it first time around. And then finally, just to say, it's going to be the last Monday of every month. Everything is booked up for the next year. Um, with the exception of March, um, they will all be at four o'clock on the last Monday. March is going to be at one o'clock because Anna Nowak, uh, Professor of Oncology from Western Australia, is speaking on that. So to allow for the time difference. And then in May, we've brought it forward a week to avoid the bank holiday. So the next presentations, we've got one about surgery after Mars, uh, after Mars 2. We have one about setting up MDTs with Kevin Blythe and Paul Beckett. And then Anna Noack and March, and, there's, and they're all advertised on our, on our website and the back of our magazine or in our magazine. So once again, gentlemen, thank you very much. And thank you to everybody that's joined us. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Thank you. Goodbye.